but an injunction for our capability to actually open our branches. Okay? And, and what the Fed was looking at was X, Y, Z, and Y was the fact that our patches aren't up to date because our guys are overworked. So what I want to do is I want to implement this program which solves Y, which means the Fed's happy, which means we open our four branches. Okay? He started the conversation like that. It's a completely different way than talking about, oh my gosh, you know, rampant malware out there is infecting machines that don't have patches. The average patch latency in a business is 40 days, blah, blah, blah. Totally different way um, and, and completely change it. Now, this gentleman, although he had a great you know, uh, presentation and whatnot, uh, he didn't get the idea to do all that just by himself. Uh, the person he actually talked to was the VP of marketing. Okay, we saw this was another interesting trend that we saw is um, those who were at the top of their game from a security perspective leveraged other people in the business to help with their case. So in this case, we've actually saw a couple CSOs who use marketing people to say, hey, can you take my look at my presentation and see if there's any way you could simplify it? That's what marketing people do, right? They take a complex thing, simplify it so people will buy it. Um, and that helped him simplify his proposition and simplify his scenarios when he went to pos uh, position this project. Second thing that we, uh, or third thing that we saw was reduced risk, okay? Everybody seems to focus on risk, whether they're doing a quantitative approach with numbers and metrics with impact and probability, et cetera, or they're just doing a red, green, yellow, high, medium, low approach. Um, all of those that use risk as their main communication metric, again, the, this, the executive teams and management didn't seem to listen too well, okay? What really was important was that the fact that the risk was high, medium, or low isn't too much of a concern. It's the probability of that risk that really matters to the organization. Is this going to happen tomorrow or is this going to happen in three years? And many times we saw pretty strategic projects when they'd go in, they'd look at the risk. The strategic project wasn't necessarily solving a high risk item, maybe a medium or a low risk item, but it was a high probability item of it actually occurring. So the situation that I have to talk about is, you know, if you have a, a low probability item and, or a high probability item that's medium to low risk, you know, you get a couple of those and you immediately have a very high risk situation. Okay, so focus on probability. Uh, lastly, uh, your numbers are a point in time, they don't show those internal trends. So when you're looking at those repeatable measurements, like I mentioned, if you can easily trend those uh, before you're even talking to the executive management team, you'll completely discredit any arguments they have of saying, well, that just was because of last week's you know, rushed orders, or that was because of this. So you can start trending some things. And then lastly, we saw a pretty interesting thing, which was um, if you have IT involved in any strategic planning meetings and IT's heading any projects, they ended up failing. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me clarify that. What I meant is if it was a strategic project and IT was actually spearheading it, meaning managing the meetings, getting involved because IT had a vested interest in it, it usually just fell on its face. What we saw was companies implementing committees, usually of say three to five people, where the business was all involved and there was one IT person and he translated from the business speak to the tech speak, okay? And that's all he did, which is translate things. Now, IT had great involvement and uh, reward out of these programs, um, but by having the business make majority of decisions and spending most of their time educating the business, uh, those projects never got unfunded, uh, were much more successful, and usually were adopted by the business as acceptable safe practices, as opposed to look at the Gestapo coming in on me trying to do something, okay? So that's it, all I had for uh, a last piece there. Like I said before, there's gonna be a lot more um, information forthcoming. We found lots of interesting data, also on what metrics were very successful too. So uh, do look out for that report. But any questions at all from a high level? Oh, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> So the question was, you have accuracy and probability, and, and you know, those two together can be difficult to measure over time and be accurate on, right? Um, and so what we saw is actually, it's all about your internal measurements. So what you can, you can't control industry data or things outside of it, but you can control your internal measurements. And so um, when it comes to probabilities, um, people do not look at security like they do disaster recovery, but they should. Um, we have seen companies simulate fake disasters, fake virus outbreaks, et cetera, to get some of those probability metrics. So you want to, hey, you're having an argument or debate on how probable this is, go try it out in a small segment of the network and see how probable it actually was. That will give you, a, you know, your information that you need. Any other questions at all? No? Oh, go ahead. You talked about the balanced scorecards. Uh, have you been providing 
provided with any examples from your survey responders, mm -hmm. and is that something that you can you know, sanitize and make yeah. and share with others? So the question was, with the balanced scorecard approach, was there any templates I saw or anything that I could give back to the community? Uh, very actually, very on time point, I actually had a, a discussion with the editor of Information Week uh, last week about doing exactly that. Um, no, nobody in our survey used the balanced scorecard like I mentioned, but a couple people that I did interview outside that I researched did. Um, we asked them if we could modify some of those or come up with our own. So we're probably going to be releasing them either with that report or a supplemental by the end of the year or some of those type of things. I personally, within my own IT consultancy business, have been using the balanced scorecard for years. I just never linked up anything until I started really diving deep in the survey. Um, but we have been implementing something very similar to it for our clients for years. Um, so we have some of that too that we can leverage. Go ahead. Right, so the question was, a lot of companies are talking about compliance and how uh, there's a difference between being in compliant and being truly secure. Um, and you're 100% right. If the only argument you ever have is, does it matter for compliance, th that means you have an immediate education issue. And not an education issue from a security perspective. I'm talking about an education of what your value is to the business. So when I talk to a CSO who mentions that to me, Mike, the only hammer I have is compliance. And uh, of course, when you only have one hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So if you've met your compliance requirements and you pass your audit, why are you there, right? Um, and so the question I said back to him was, well, we need to start looking at you from a strategic perspective. How does security help the business? So in this case, it was, case, it was an actual SaaS provider. And um, I told them, you know what, you can start using marketing or security within your marketing and start tracking some things. Can you work with the sales team, for example, and say, hey, if we build some marketing literature about our security processes, can you start tracking if that helps you close deals? Okay? So over about an eight-month period, he went back to the, to the board and said, listen, we did a little survey and come to find out we got this really big banking customer because we opened the kimono a little bit about our security processes and they saw what, what we did and they liked it. And so, you know, that was a thing that led to a sale. So now, security is not just there as a, you know, compliance requirement checkbox, it's enabling sales, right? It's enabling marketing's capability and things like that. So um, I always tell people, you're always stuck in the forest, so you've got to step out. Compliance is a good thing from an idea perspective because it's supposed to help uh, ensure that, you know, customers are protected, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we seem to lose sight of that sometimes. And most of the reasons why consumers like compliance requirements is it's protecting them yet we don't tell consumers how we're protecting them, right, and things like that. So um, I would say you want to look, take a step back and look at what are the other things that are important to the business that you can do um, that can help them. There's another great example, too, uh, not to get too long-winded, but um, they had an issue with uh, salespeople leaving the organization and stealing customers. So they went in and uh, he sold a DLP email archiving project to management because it allowed them to print out exactly what the salespeople were doing before they left to prove in court or not whether they actually stole a sales list. Okay, to that business that was very important, right? Um, now he had 15 other issues why DLP was interesting to him, but um, those were the ones that he leveraged from the business perspective and why the business bought in. So, all right. I'm um, good, guys. If you have any more questions, you can come see me off stage. Thank you for your time.